Hey, it's Stephanie. As many of us take time away from work this summer, you may find yourself thinking about what life could look like during a different kind of time off, retirement. This week, we're bringing you a favorite episode from a few months ago on how to plan a 100-year life. We'll be back with an all-new episode next week. Hope you enjoy this one. We have to raise our aspirations and say, what would we want a century long life to look like and begin to envision it because we can't achieve what we can't envision. Welcome to the Best New Ideas in Money, a podcast from MarketWatch. I'm Stephanie Kelton. I'm an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. And I'm Jeremy Olshan, the editor of MarketWatch. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. Increasingly, people live a third of their lives after they stop working. But there's no playbook on how to spend your time and money during those years. Most of our models of the life cycle date back to when we worked until we couldn't work anymore. Retirement was originally just a brief coda. Now that some people are living well into their 90s and maybe beyond, we may need a new financial and societal plan that goes further than just school, work, retirement, to give joy and purpose to what is a fairly big chunk of time. Today we're going to talk about ways to rethink our extended life stages. There are second acts in American life, and third acts, and fourth acts. We're all more like long-running Netflix shows. So it's time to redesign our life map the plan that reflects the new potential of our longevity. There's a lot of awareness about an aging society, but I think that is to miss the most important thing, which is not that there's just more old people, but the real change is longevity. Andrew Scott is an economics professor at London Business School. A lot of his work focuses on interest rates, but he says he's obsessed with longevity. It's how we adjust to those longer lives, and that's not just what you do at the end of the life, It's what you do over all of life. When we imagine the possibility of living longer, we generally think about what it means to tack on more years to the end of our lives. Researchers like Andrew Scott and Laura Karstensen, who you heard at the top of the show, say that's not how we should look at it. Instead, we need to do two things. Improve our health to improve the quality of our longer lives and rethink what we do and when. You have more time ahead of you, which means you've got to invest more in your future self. You've got to invest more in your health. You've got to invest more in your skills, your relationship and your sense of purpose. It's really important to age well. But I think that's about recognizing more time ahead and more investing in your future rather than aging, which often conjures up lots of fears about being old. The arc of our lives generally follows three phases that most of us take for granted education, work, and retirement. But Scott says that's a relatively recent idea. Time is a social convention. Society structures time in different ways to make the most of it. So in the 20th century, we invented the weekend. The weekend didn't used to exist. We also invented teenagers and retirement. Before the 20th century had children and adults, we didn't have teenagers. And what we're seeing now as life expectancy increases is the model of life that was sort of developed in the 20th century. It's struggling to match the length of life that we're living. Laura Karstensen is the founding director of the Stanford Center on Longevity. She and other academics who work on different aspects of the field got together to tackle the problem of how to best live our extended lives. The more we started talking to each other, that is, the faculty at Stanford, and started thinking about this, we thought, could Stanford do for human aging what it did for communications technology in Silicon Valley? Could we form partnerships, work hand-in-hand with industries and business, media, policymakers, and together begin a kind of iterative process that could bring about real change? And we said, let's do it. Part of the Center for Longevity's recent work has been drawing a new life map. 
The new map of life is a major initiative we started in 2018, and this report follows two years of work by nine postdoctoral fellows that we appointed at the center to really dive deeply into these core domains of life that need to change. And what the new map of life is really about is zooming out and beginning to paint a picture or chart a course of what a high quality life would look like that lasts for a hundred years and rethink then how the current model, which was designed around lives that last about 50 years, <laughs> mismatches those cultural scripts. The new Map of Life initiative reimagined models for lifelong learning, work, healthcare policy, housing, the environment, and financial planning. A longer life means reconsidering your career and asking how you'll sustain it or how it will sustain you over time. Here's Andrew Scott again. If you're living to 90, you'll probably be working to your mid-70s. So that's like a 55-year career. And we cannot have 55-year careers like we used to have. Because what can you learn at 20 that's still going to keep you skillful and employed in your 70s? You then need to invest also in your productive assets, your skills and knowledge, the things that will actually keep you in work for longer. And it may not be your current job. It may be learning new skills for a new job. Or it could be updating your existing skills so you're more future-proof against technology. What we're clearly seeing with both technology and longevity is that you're not going to have just one job that defines you over your career. That's a concept that really challenges the way most Americans think about work. I think it makes a sense of identity and a sense of purpose really key. And if you think about a three-stage life moving towards a multi-stage life, you know, the role of your current job and your current employer is going to be much less in defining your identity. What does define your identity? Scott sees this as an opportunity to ask questions about what we really want from our lives and maybe to make some new plans. I loved going to college in my early 20s because I came from a certain background with a certain set of values and I met all these different people from different backgrounds and different values. And that helped me decide who I was and what I thought was important. But here I am in my mid 50s and it'd be quite nice to go through that experience again and update them and sort of learn from different types of people. So there's something about learning that is not just about learning to do the skill at work. And that, of course, is about lifelong learning. When experts give advice about retirement, they usually focus on saving. But we should probably focus just as much on sustaining or changing our work. If the real key to your financial success is not just saving but working longer, it's also about future-proofing your career. And for the listener, that'll be about updating skills, but also making sure that you know, you don't get bored in what you're currently doing. Some people do and want to do something different. And if you think you might be bored carrying on working for a long time, then the question is, well, how do I avoid that? And what do I need to shift into? So I think a key part of financial planning is not just the savings, but also just thinking about skills and maintaining your career and investing in that. Expanded longevity means each chapter of our life is extended, not just the final ones. I think what we've really got to do with longevity is recognize that we need a new map of life. And that's not just about how we look after old people, it's also how young people are supported. Because they are going to live a much longer life. And how do they get the financial security that was provided to past generations? How do they manage their education over a lifetime? And in many ways, I think it's the young who are most in need of a longevity agenda. Because the old ways of having a secure career that will provide you a reasonable pension just isn't there for them anymore. In the same way humans made up money, we also made up the path of modern life. Scott says we can reinvent this structure to make it work better for us. There are two important factors to consider about age. One is the opposite of chronological age, which is not how many years that you've lived, but how many years you've got to go. And the other thing that's really important is your biological age, your health. People age really differently. And some of that is genetic, but a lot of it is to do with your behavior and your environment. Aging is actually seems to be pretty malleable, so you can influence how you age. Staying healthy into old age isn't only better for us individually. 
Scott says it could actually contribute to our economy in a couple of different ways. One is, well, just think of all the money you'd save from medical costs because you wouldn't be caring for all these age-related diseases. And the other is, oh, look, people are working longer, the economy's stronger. And the best estimate I've seen says that one more extra year of working in a later retirement boosts GDP by 1%. If you could slow down aging, which some scientists say is a possibility, such that you live longer, but you live longer in better health, you know, looking at the whole US population now and in the future, that's worth a staggering $37 trillion. So Stephanie, you know, many people hearing this whole life map idea may think, well, that sounds much more like a luxury than a choice. A common refrain is, I'm going to have to keep working because I don't have enough money to retire ever. Yeah, I think you hear lots of people say exactly that. I mean, the thought of retirement is something that just doesn't, frankly, occur to a large segment of the population. They don't see it in their future because they don't have the finances in place. They can't imagine a scenario under which they would have enough money to survive on, just meeting life's basic needs. So they expect to work for the rest of their lives. And for other people, it's the exact opposite. They're thinking about how soon can I retire? And you know, what will I do to keep my life fulfilling? for the remaining years of my life. So I think you're exactly right. I think that you know the life map in a lot of ways sounds like a luxury for those fortunate enough to be able to stop working at some point and just start living. I guess that also makes the case for why you need the life map. We need to rethink the way we approach you know, the arc of people's careers, even no matter what your job is, whether you're you know, a college professor, a pilot, or a welder, there should be other paths to take to provide opportunities to continue making money, but also pursue other interests and activities. Our culture is terrible at this. We push people out the door after they get to a certain age. It would be really good to have a way for people to transition in their 50s or something like that, where they're not quite ready to stop working, but they can't continue in the occupation that they have. So maybe a welder goes on to you know, help train the next generation of welders in an apprenticeship program or something like that. I think about people who are teachers or police officers or firefighters where they do have that pension and they are able to retire at a relatively early age and do have those additional chapters. I mean, they, you, know, you have so much life left. But for, like you said, Stephanie, for many uh, careers, there isn't that stability. You don't have that pension to rely on that gives you the freedom to, you know, go in those other directions. Yeah, my mom retired as a teacher, and I, I know that she looked forward to retirement. Financially, she was in a, in a good position with my father, and they looked forward to retirement, and they're very active and very busy, and they've found all kinds of things. And I don't think everybody is looking for a way to continue to build work into the later part of their life. So how should you think about the chapters of your life? And what can you do now to create a more financially secure future? Plus, we'll meet someone who redesigned their own life map. All of that's after the break. Welcome back to the best new ideas in money. Before the break, we heard about designing a new life map to match our new expectations of a longer life. A longer life also means different calculations in terms of what we'll need to save for retirement. Well, you know, most people think that they're not ready for retirement, and most people are exactly right. Teresa Gillarducci is a professor of economics at the New School for Social Research and author of the book Rescuing Retirement. The chances that our parents could have maintained their living standards into retirement actually are higher on average than people who are working now. And that's because we have had a do-it-yourself retirement system for the past 40 years. After the Reagan administration in the 1980s, those benefits have been cut gradually over time, sort of like a frog in a pan of water that's getting hotter and hotter. The erosion of the Social Security benefit has been so slow that we've hardly noticed it. 
What most of us rely on now to supplement Social Security are personal savings and possibly an employer-based 401k. Gillarducci says that isn't enough. Wages haven't gone up much, but living expenses have. The promise that somehow your own savings, your own accumulation in your house, your own 401k, your individual retirement account will kind of make up um, for what we lost in Social Security, that promise just didn't pan out. And workers' lives, for the most part, haven't been the kind of lives where you can steadily save your pay in order to reach a standard. Jobs are a lot less secure. Wages didn't go up. So our system is really not well matched to the kind of people in labor market we have. The way things are today, the responsibility to save has shifted onto the individual. Gillarducci says that people should go into retirement having saved anywhere from $300,000 to $2 million, depending on their income and lifestyle. What we have is that the people in the bottom half of the income distribution have nothing. And even people in the top 10% who should have millions in their accounts on average only have 200,000. So on the face of it, the system has failed. There just isn't enough retirement assets to supplement social security for the years that you need. Gillarducci says the expectations set up by our current retirement system are unrealistic and that people end up feeling shame when they haven't saved enough. It's impractical to say that a 25-year-old you know, should save 3% of their pay voluntarily for all their life. Or for a 50-year-old newly divorced woman to say, oh, you better catch up here, save half of what you earn. It just isn't practical for people's lives, you know, on a human basis, on just the practicality of being an American worker. So it means a lot of shame and disappointment. The fear of running out of savings in retirement is another source of anxiety. We're also finding in the data that older people are more and more responsible for keeping their nest egg intact for their whole lives. They're told, hey, you might live into 100, you know, so you better not spend it all. So they have thousands of dollars in their shoebox tucked away in their bank account, but they're skipping lunch. The other thing we see in America, and it's a very much American disease, is that we have really high rates of financial predation on the elderly. That's right about the time that you become a little more isolated. Your family size is a lot smaller. Cognitive decline or pre-cognitive decline creeps in. It's hard enough, you know, for a professional to actually manage money and have it spend down, but it's almost impossible for an individual. So they get the phone calls, you know, to invest into some scheme. And so we have five times the rate of financial predation of older people than they do in other countries like ours. So how did we get here? Gilarducci says back in the 1980s, two things happened. The first thing that happened was that Social Security benefits were cut for boomers. And, and the defined benefit system was very much attacked in favor of a system called a 401k or defined contribution plan. Its cousin is the individual retirement account, but they both share the characteristic that in order to have something besides Social Security when you retire, you needed to save on your own. It was designed for maximum freedom, for maximum individual control. It was designed because there was a lot of faith that private financial markets would help workers get a good fair rate of return. The one sector that didn't have their defined benefit plans destroyed in favor of these 401k plans were in the public sector. So you still have teachers and firefighters and cops still on the defined benefit system. The hope was that private sector employers that didn't offer pension plans would adopt the 401k as a less expensive alternative. Instead, Gilarducci says, many employers who had pension plans drop them in favor of 401ks in order to save money. One solution Gilarducci suggests is what she calls a sidecar plan that would help workers who don't have pensions. She worked with one of the Trump administration's economic advisors to create one. We propose 
that for a fraction of the cost we're paying now, that the government provide a match, contribute to every dollar a low-income worker contributes. The thrift savings plan is what federal employees have. That's their pension plan. We propose a branch of that plan that would take in private sector workers. So if a low-income worker contributes 1%, the federal government would come in with 3%. Another idea is a savings plan that is slightly more like a pension in that it's managed by vetted professional investors. In my book, I've described a plan that would reach up to all workers, where they would put their dollar for retirement savings into that plan, and it would be managed by private sector managers that a board of trustees would pick, much like employees of the Federal Reserve System. They put in money, their employer puts in money, and then a suite of professional managers invest that money for them. Does the creation of these sidecar plans really resolve the underlying issues in our retirement system? Well, I think they hope it does. I think that, you know, it's a way of recognizing that there's something wrong with the system the way it is, that it doesn't provide the sort of support that millions of people need in retirement in terms of, you know, income security. Economists and sometimes financial planners will often talk about retirement using an analogy to a three-legged stool. What they mean is that there are supposed to be three legs around which you build your retirement nest egg. One of the legs is Social Security. Another is your personal savings. And the third, if you're lucky enough to have one, is a traditional pension from your employer. The legs of that stool have become really wobbly. Pensions are harder and harder to come by, and the private savings piece just isn't there. So the sidecar is really about shoring up the private saving piece. But of course, there is that other leg, which is Social Security. And I guess another way to go about this would be to just strengthen that leg of the stool, use the existing Social Security system, and deal with the problem by you know, making benefits more generous. The key way to strengthen the savings leg of that stool is to get people to save more and save earlier. The best way to do that seems to be nudges Uh, which we've talked about in earlier episodes, to get people to automatically enroll in their plans, making that the default, say, or getting them to automatically escalate the percent they contribute um, so they reach the optimum level of savings. People dread getting older, but maybe they shouldn't. Stanford professor Laura Carstensen says that in many ways, life actually gets better. Emotionally speaking, life does get better. And it's probably my favorite lecture that I give to Stanford undergraduates. It's the lecture where I talk about the misery myth that older people are unhappy and lonely and dejected and tell them that they're doing much better than those who are 18 and 19 years old. And you should see their faces light up. It's really hard to be young. It's hard to be young today, especially. Rates of depression, of loneliness, are higher in young adults than in older adults. I mean, like twice as high. For them to know that things get better is really important. My name is Raymond A. Jetson. I'm 65 years old. I've lived most of my life in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I've taken a far from traditional path. Raymond is a good example of what it means to redraw your life map. It's been an interesting journey, but I wouldn't trade anything for it because I believe that it now positions me to make the most of those extra 30 years that I hadn't planned on when I started. Raymond grew up thinking he would retire in his 60s, and that would be it. I didn't have the luxury of seeing retirement through rose-colored glasses. Most of the men in my family worked with their hands and worked hard. They were carpenters. They were meat cutters. They worked for the railroad. And by the time they reached 65, they were broken. After leaving the Louisiana State Legislature, Raymond led a nonprofit, worked as a pastor, and became an advanced leadership fellow at Harvard. The path that I have 
unintentionally and organically followed is going to be one that is much more prevalent, especially as we start these, you know, the hundred year life that's going to be a reality here soon. I think that there are a couple of things that are really important if we're going to be around here another 30 years after what has traditionally been retirement age. And one is, as best you possibly can, take care of your health. And so what I've had to do with as much intentionality as I have with my health, I've had to be intentional about my financial health. If I am going to live to 100. What do I need to make that the most comfortable and quality experience I can? And that might vary by by individual, but what is it that's critical? Raymond hasn't followed a traditional linear path. He's switched careers, he's gone back to school, and he stayed open to new possibilities. I am in a really interesting place in life. I have been around long enough to actually have experienced some things, to have learned from some critical mistakes, and to have gotten a few things right along the way so that there is some wisdom which goes with the gray hair. But I'm also still young enough to do something with it, to work in service to my family, my community, others who are around me. But not only that, I can share and be an oftentimes unintentional example for others. So yes, I think I'll be around here for a while. It can be daunting to think about the decades ahead and how you're going to pay for them. But can the idea of creating a new life map give us a more optimistic outlook for our future? If we look at longevity as adding time to our entire lifespan, rather than just extending our old age, it opens up a world of opportunity. Thanks for listening to the best new ideas in money. You can subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like the show, please leave us a review. As you probably already know, it's the single biggest way other listeners discover us. And if you have ideas for future episodes, drop us a line at bestnewideasinmoney at marketwatch.com. Thanks to Andrew Scott, Laura Karstensen, Teresa Gillarducci, and Raymond Jetson. To learn more about rethinking your life map, head to marketwatch.com. I'm Stephanie Kelton. And I'm Jeremy Elshan. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast from Market Watch, produced by Best Case Studios. Devin Maverick-Robbins and Suzanne Myers are our producers, and our associate producer is Hannah Leibowitz lockhart The executive producer for Best Case Studios is Adam Pincus. For Market Watch, Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer, and the associate producer is Katie Ferguson. Jeremy Binks is our news editor. This episode was mixed by Katie Ferguson. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. Stephanie Kelton is an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and not part of the MarketWatch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea.